I think we're good. Uh, welcome, everyone, for this uh, uh, next edition of TCS Plus. We're very happy to have Eric Balkansky from Harvard today. Uh, before I introduce Eric, um, let me uh, first thank the organizers that are helping out um, behind the scenes to bring you TCS Plus. So that's Clement Canon, Ninja Day, who's with us uh, today, Gautam Kamat, um, Ilya Rosenstein, and Odette Regev. Um, so let me continue and go around the table um, so that everyone who's here today can say hi. So first of all, we have uh, Andreas with a group uh, from um, Hasso Plattner Institute. So welcome, everyone. Uh, and India is joining us from uh, Northwestern. Uh, then Santiago is joining us from EAFIT. Welcome. Um, then we have uh, Ben Lee from Caltech. And finally, seeing you on a uh, nice group from Toronto, uh, enjoying lunch over there, I guess. Um, so bon appetit. Um, and all right, so um, let me also just say that uh, this there is going to be one more TCS Plus uh, this semester. In two weeks from now, Julia Chutzoy from TTIC will be our last speaker for the for the fall. And so today we're happy to have uh, Eric Balkansky um, give the talk. So Eric is a PhD student with Yaron Singer at uh, Harvard, and he's done work generally in uh, machine learning and uh, algorithms. He's done a series of works on the sample complexity of optimization algorithms. And today he's going to tell us about uh, adaptive complexity of maximizing submodular uh, function. So thanks, Eric. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and uh, the invitation to speak at uh, TCS Plus. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the adaptive complexity of maximizing a submodular function. Uh, and this is joint work with my advisor, Yaron Singer. And uh, through the talk, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. I'm really I'm happy to take any. Um, so, the standard algorithm for submodular optimization is a simple, greedy algorithm. And I would like to start this talk by uh, illustrating this algorithm um, with, for the example of uh, maximum coverage, which is a special case of some modular function. Um, so an instance of maximum coverage can be represented as a bipartite graph with top nodes and bottom nodes. And the goal is to pick uh, the top k nodes for some integer k that cover the largest number of bottom nodes. So for example, uh, this node covers one bottom node and these two nodes cover three bottom nodes. And so what the greedy algorithm does is that um, it has a current solution and at every iteration, it's going to add to the solution uh, the one element with the largest marginal contribution to the solution. So in the case of maximum coverage, what that means is that at every iteration, the greedy algorithm is going to add the one top node that covers the largest number of bottom nodes not yet covered. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, with with this co uh, maximum coverage instance, what the greedy algorithm would would do is first pick this one node that covers uh, five bottom nodes, then this second node that covers um, three uh, new nodes, and then finally this node uh, that covers one new node. Okay. And um, so greed algorithm performs, has strong uh, performance guarantees. But I want to argue that one main drawback of the greed algorithm is that it is highly sequential. Um, and Sorry, so just for Eric, like for someone who hasn't seen this problem before, so what's the guarantee? I mean, is this... Um... Yeah. Yeah, so I, so I will mention that after, but okay. uh, the maximum coverage is especially uh, an instance of similar optimization. And we know that the greedy algorithm obtains the one minus one over approximation. Uh, for maximizing a submodular function under continuity constraint k. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, so we know it has good guarantees. So one minus one over multiplicative approximation compared to the optimal solution. Uh, but I want to argue that the main drawback is that uh, it has uh, it's highly sequential. So the one main takeaway of this illustration is that uh, when you, I want you to observe that at every iteration the node that was picked crucially dependent, uh, crucially dependent on the node that was picked at the previous iteration. And so that's why uh, we say that greedy has k adaptive steps for picking the k best for, for picking the k best elements. Okay. 
And so in this talk, I'm going to be interested in this trade-off between rounds of adaptivity and uh, performance of an algorithm, which is going to be measured by its multiplicative approximation compared to the optimal solution. Okay. And so for the greedy algorithm, uh, we just saw that it's uh, K-adaptive, if we want, where we have a quality constraint K, so for picking the K best elements. So this can be linear in N, so the size of the problem, size of the ground set of elements. And again, it's well known that the greedy algorithm obtains the one method over E approximation for maximizing a monotone submodular function and the quality constraint. And we also know that this one method over approximation is the best possible for any polynomial time algorithm. Okay. And so now let me make um, this uh, concept of adaptivity uh, more formal. So we're going to say that an algorithm is R adaptive if it makes R sequential rounds, where in each round, uh, the algorithm may uh, evaluate multiple queries in parallel. Okay, so what it means is that um, there's going to be some, uh, we're going to have Oracle access to some function f that we wish to optimize. And for the running of this curve, we're going to assume it's a set function. So given some set of elements, it's going to return the value of these elements. And so then um, the algorithm is going to proceed in rounds, where in each round, the algorithm may query, uh, at, let's say, most polynomially many different sets. And so these are going to be simultaneous queries that are going to be evaluated in parallel by the, by the Oracle. And then the Oracle will return to the algorithm the value of these sets. And then based, uh, based on, the, on the value of these sets, the algorithm can adaptively uh, query a new batch uh, of sets. So submit a, ask again for pointing many uh, sets and the algorithm returns its values. And then the algorithm, uh, and then it's going to proceed in one like this. And then, we, and then an algorithm is R adaptive if it makes R rounds of queries. Okay. Sorry, just one more naive question. So the yeah. value of a set is the number of elements, um, not um, that they, they cover that the set covers, or um, that haven't been covered yet that the set covers. Yeah. Good. So. Um, so this is, we're going to consider a general function f, but for the case of maximum coverage, here um, a set will consider a collection of top nodes, and then the function will return just the number of bottom nodes that are covered by this set. Okay. That's the question? Yeah. Good. Okay. And so this concept of adaptivity is important because it's going to correspond to the parallel runtime of an algorithm when an algorithm can evaluate multiple queries uh, in parallel. Okay, so it can do multiple function, it can execute multiple function evaluations in parallel. Uh, so, so Eric, uh, yeah. you're not putting any constraints on the number of queries made in one particular round. Good, yeah, so, so, there's, so yes, so there's also this, uh, this question of like how many queries I need. And so the, the main question I'm going to be interested in is like the adaptivity versus the um, approximation guarantee. So I'm just going to allow poly many queries per round. But it's true that uh, there's also like a question of how many queries uh, I, I do in every round. And for now, we're just going to allow poly many per round. Good. Um, and so now we're going to say that the adaptive complexity of a problem is going to be the minimum number of rounds such that there exists an R adaptive algorithm that obtains a constant factor approximation. So what we're saying is that we want to obtain a constant factor approximation and we want to understand how many rounds we need to obtain a constant factor approximation. Okay. So a related uh, line of work um, related to adaptivity uh, that's uh, recent is on optimization from samples. And that's at the intersection of learning and optimization. And so here, the, the high level motivation is that uh, we want to optimize some function, but the, the true underlying function is unknown. And instead, we only have access to some erroneous function that has been learned from sample data. And what we would like to know is what kind of optimization guarantees we can have when we 
optimize such an error nearest function that has been learned from data. Okay. And so to answer this question, uh, we have the optimization from samples model that is as follow. Um, the underlying function f that we want to optimize is unknown. And we're given um, the input is going to be the same as in learning. So it's going to be some sample data. And so what, are, what is a sample? A sample is a set s drawn from a distribution and its value according to the function. And we're going to be given poly many sets um, drawn IID from some distribution d. And so this is similar as in PAC or PMAC learning. And then the output is going to be the same as an optimization. We're going to want to find a set S that maximizes the function under some constraints. Okay, so this is optimization from samples. And so the main result for optimization from sample is actually an impossibility result. Um, it says that it's actually impossible to get a good approximation um, for some modular maximization when giving samples drawn from any distribution. So to make this a bit more formally, it says that there's no algorithm that can obtain an approximation better than n to the one negative one fourth. And we would like to get a constant factor approximation. And this is for maximizing a monotone submodular function under continuity constraints when um, given poly many samples drawn from any distribution. Okay. Quantifiers are a little bit ambiguous. So what yes. do you mean by um from any distribution, you mean that uh, from yeah. for any fixed distribution um, that is known to the algorithm, the algorithm does not exist, or for every algorithm there's you know a distribution. Yeah. So what it means is uh, that I'm going I'm going to let you pick a distribution of your choice, and for any distribution that you might pick, okay, uh, it's impossible to be optimal to be able to optimize the family of some modular function for this distribution. But the algorithm can depend on the distribution. Um, so what do you, so the, so the algorithm will be given samples from this distribution. It knows the distribution. The, the yeah, distribution. It, it can know the distribution. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, good. Um, and so this, um, impossibility results, um, it also, uh, we also have similar impossibility results for the case of like maximum coverage which I mentioned at the beginning, and which is a special case of some other optimization. Um, also for convex optimization and for some other minimization. Um, and so these results, they also hold for like some classes of functions that are actually pack learnable. So a first important implication of this result is that there are some functions that given sample data are learnable, and when given the exact functions, um, they are optimizable, but they cannot be optimized when giving poly many samples. So this should be a bit surprising. We would expect that a function that is both learnable and optimizable should maybe be optimizable from samples. Okay. And then the second implication is that it's we can actually get in general we can get no desirable guarantee for optimization of problems in P, when the objective is learned from poly many samples drawn from any distribution, even when this function is PAC or PMAC learnable. Okay. So these are strong impossibility results. And I'd like to argue that the main reason for these impossibility results is um, because these optimization from samples algorithm are non-adaptive algorithms. And what I mean by that is that the algorithm only receives that input probably many non-adaptive samples. And so maybe the algorithm can look at these samples, learn something about the function, but then they cannot ad adaptively ask for uh, additional information to, uh, about the function, it cannot query additional sets based on the value of the samples it has observed. Okay. And so if we come back to uh, our original question of like, what is this relationship between adaptivity and approximation, um, the results about Australian from samples imply the following, um, that we cannot get a cost factor approximation in one round, so with non-adaptive algorithm. So these impossibility results for 
algorithms that are given as input poly many samples also extend for any algorithm that can query poly many non-adaptive sets in one round. So for any non-adaptive algorithm. Okay. So we know we can get um, a good so a constant approximation with linearly many rounds. We know that uh, it's impossible in one round, but until very recently, we didn't know anything of what was happening between these two points. And in particular, uh, every other known existing constant factor approximation for maximizing a monotone submodular function under any constraints had adaptivity at least had linear adaptivity, at least linear adaptivity. Okay. And so this is going to be the main question we're going to want to ask. What is the adaptive complexity of maximizing a submodular functions? How many rounds do we need to obtain a constant factor approximation for submodular optimization? Okay. So before I dive into the main result, are there any questions about uh, the main question in the setup? No. Okay, good. So I'm going to present the main result. Actually, sorry, I do have one question. I'm just yeah. slightly confused as to the when is it that you have enough information to solve the problem? I'm still thinking about the original set cover, like top set yeah. cover, whatever thing that you had. So, because just, just to make sure, so when you make a query, you query sets at the top and you returned the number of elements at the bottom that they cover, but not which elements they cover. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, if you query all possible sets, um, the, the, that's enough to solve the problem. Good. So yeah, so one thing that we could do is just like query all of the sets in one round in parallel, and then we could just pick the best one. But um, oh, yeah, that would be non-efficient because there's exponentially many, many top sets, and we're just going to restrict um, to like having efficient algorithm, and we allow at most poly many queries per round. Yeah, so, so this previous slide that you showed us that said there exists no algorithm, you meant there exists no efficient algorithm. Yes, that, exactly. That, yeah, that, okay. Said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, so thanks. Yeah, so no, uh, no efficient algorithm. And here, yeah, we, we want to ask for this case where we allow poly many uh, queries per round. Good. Okay, so the main result. So the main result is that we show that the adaptive complexity of maximizing a monotone submodular function under current T constraint is up to lower the term uh, log n. So this main result, it consists of two major parts. So the first part is a new algorithm that obtains a constant factor approximation in log n rounds. And the second part is a harness result that shows that it's impossible uh, to do, to obtain this in almost, uh, in, a, in, 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 less, in almost, uh, in, in less rounds. So what it says is that it's impossible to get a one over log n approximation, approximation in log n over log log n rounds. Okay. So to make these uh, results more formal, we first show that there exists a log n adaptive algorithm that obtains with high probability an approximation arbitrarily close to one third. And we also show that there is no log n over log log n adaptive algorithm that obtains even with low probability a one over log n approximation. Okay. And so the the main implication, the main takeaway of this result, I think, is that this algorithm, it gives us an exponential improvement in the adaptivity, so in the power runtime, over any previous constant factor approximation algorithm for some modular maximization. Okay. So if we're in the setting where we can uh, evaluate, if we can do function, if we can execute function evaluation in parallel, and we can now optimize, uh, so we can now do some optimization exponentially faster. Okay. So importantly, uh, the the algorithm it relies on a new on a new technique that uh, we're going to call adaptive sampling. And so let me tell you a bit more about this new technique. So if we come back to the impossibility result I previously mentioned. What this result said is that 
it's impossible to get an end to the negative one for type optimization given poly many non-adaptive non samples drawn from any distribution. Okay. But then given this impossibility results, one similarly as in active learning, one might ask what happens if I can get multiple batches of sample. So get one batch of sample from some distribution, then let the algorithm design some other distribution, and then get another batch of samples. Okay. And so that's exactly what the algorithm is going to do. What the adaptive sampling technique does is that at every round, based on the previous samples, so the values of the values of previous sets observed, we're going to update a new distribution and sample sets on this distribution. So we're going to have one distribution at every at every round. And so I'm going to denote uh, the marginal probability of each element being in a set drawn from this distribution by P1 through Pn for each element A1 through An, okay? And so what's the main idea here is that if we look at the space of uh, potential solutions, um, in the first round, we don't have any information. So what we're going to do is just like, the best thing we can do is just to evenly sample the space of feasible solution. So here you can imagine that this red cross is the optimal solution. And then based on these samples, we can slowly zoom in towards regions that have high valued sets. And so at every iteration, we can have a distribution that's a bit more precise and slowly zooms in to the optimal solution. Okay. And so now phrasing this previous result about adaptivity in terms of like sampling, what it's saying is that we roughly need log n batches of adaptive samples um, to approximately learn to optimize some modular functions. Okay. So this is going to be the outline for the remaining of the talk. So I'm going to spend most, most of the talk about like, so presenting this uh, adaptive sampling algorithm that obtains this constant factor approximation in log n rounds. Then I will mention uh, the lower bound, so the almost tight lower bound. And then I will show some experiments that show that uh, adaptive sampling is a technique that can also be used in practice. And then I will mention uh, there's been several recent results about uh, adaptivity and some module optimization that I will mention at the end of this talk. Okay. Uh, but before I move on, are there any questions about the main results? No. Okay. Good. Um, so I'm going to uh, move on to present the algorithm. So I haven't yet de formally defined some modular function, so let me start by doing this. So a set function f over ground set of element n is some modular if it satisfies the property of diminishing returns. Eric, I'm sorry, there's a quick question. Um, yes. Andras is asking if the algorithm that you're going to give is for the unconstrained problem, or there's a set cardinality constraint. Good. Uh, it's going to be for the case of cardinality constraint. Um, so the, this main result is for cardinality constraints, and at the end of the talk, I will mention recent results for both the unconstrained and different types of constraints uh, as well. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Um, so, so there's some modular functions or these functions that satisfy this diminishing returns property. And so what this property says is that um, the marginal contribution of an element A to a set S. So that's the value added by A, an element A when I add it to a set S. Then the marginal contribution have to be diminishing. So what that means is that uh, as the set S is going to grow, the marginal contributions are going to be decreasing. Okay, and so these are some modular functions. And so the, the canonical problem for uh, in some optimization is maximizing a monotone submodular function and um, a maturity constraint aim. So that's like the, 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 the general uh, setting where we know how to obtain good approximations. And so I mentioned uh, that the main result is for canonity constraints. So that's a special case of like a uniform metroid. And I will come back to the general case of metroids at the end of the talk. And so um, even though there was not much that is known about uh, the adaptivity 
for this problem of some modular maximization. That's in contrast to that's in contrast to like um, a line of work on a distributed model optimization in a map reduce style settings. So here th there's been a lot of work uh, recently about this, and here the the motivation is related but different than adaptivity. So whereas adaptivity is more studies like the, the change of sequentiality. The distributed setting addresses like uh, the issue when the the function and its elements uh, are too large, uh, too large to fit on a single machine, and has to be distributed over, um, over multiple machines. Okay. Okay. So these are some modular functions, and we're going to be looking at this problem of monotone some modular maximization. So as I mentioned, the algorithm. Um, it relies on this idea of adaptive sampling. And in particular, it's going to uh, depend on two simple sampling primitives. And I'm going to start by presenting the sampling primitive at a high level, and then I will give some more formal descriptions of these sampling primitives. Okay, so what, do, what are these two sampling primitives at a high level? So first, we're going to have down sampling. And so what downsampling does is the following. So the first, the distribution of the first round, it's going to include each element in a set from distribution with equal probability because we don't have any information. And then given the first batch of samples, what it's going to do is that it's going to identify bad elements. So these are elements that we want to, disc that we want to discard and ignore in the future. And so we're going to set the emotional probability for future distributions to be zero. So we won't sample, we're going to ignore them and not sample them anymore. And so now we have a new distribution and we're going to sample again and find additional bad elements that we will discard for the future. And it's going to, uh, and so that sampling will just iterate and at every round discard some bad elements. And so with this approach, uh, we can get, uh, a, an algorithm with log n adaptivity, but it's impossible to get better than a one over log n approximation with this approach. Okay, so we are happy with the adaptivity that this approach gives us, but that was the approximation. So then, on the other hand, there's upsampling, which really can be thought as like the opposite of downsampling, where at every iteration, instead of finding bad elements, we're going to identify good elements. And so these good elements are going to be added to our uh, to a current solution and added in all of the samples in the future. And so then we first find some good elements, and then again at every iteration, we're going to find some new good elements that we're going to add to the current solution, and so on. And so in particular, um, if you look at the special case of upsampling, where at every round we find the one best element, then that's exactly the greedy algorithm. At every round, find the best element and add it to the current solution. And so it's possible to get a constant approximation with this approach. But if you want to get a constant approximation, this requires linear adaptivity. So here we were happy with the approximation, but unhappy with the adaptivity. OK. And so what's going to be the main idea behind the main algorithm? So the adaptive sampling algorithm is that it's going to appropriately combine these two sampling primitives are done sampling and up sampling. So at every iteration, depending on the context, it's either going to up sample and add good elements to the solution, or it's going to down sample and discard the element from further consideration. And by combining these two primitives, we can get the best of both worlds. We can get um, logarithmic adaptivity and constant approximation. Okay. So now let me make all of this a bit more precise. So let me first precisely define the downsampling primitive. So we're going to have some threshold T and a constant C that's a little bit larger than one. And we're going to have a set X. These are the sets of elements that are not yet discarded. So they're called the surviving elements. That's initially the ground set, so all of the elements. 
and our distribution d that we're going to have every iteration it's going to be the uniform distribution over all subsets of surviving elements of size k. So here again, k is the coordinate constraints. We want to find a solution of size k. And so we're going to have this distribution. And then uh, what we're going to do is the sum of the distribution that we're going to identify the bad elements that we're going to remove. So what are these bad elements that we're going to remove? These are going to be elements that have a low contribution to a random set drawn from D, okay? And so precisely, these are all of the elements that have modular contribution to a random set drawn from D that is at most this threshold, uh, the threshold T divided by K, since we're sampling sets of size K, and we're going to slightly higher this a little bit with the constant C, okay? And so we're going to do that until there's either less than k surviving elements, or until we we have a random set of distribution that has value at least t. So when we have once we have a random set that has high value, we can just we will just return this random set. Okay. So this was down sampling. So we want to show two things about down sampling. We want to show that it has we want to show its adaptivity and its approximation. So the main benefit of downsampling is that it has this logarithmic adaptivity. And so to show that it has this logarithmic adaptivity, uh, this relies on this main lemma that shows that at every round, the algorithm is going to discard the constant fraction of the surviving elements. So if at every round I can remove, I can discard the constant fraction of the surviving elements, then after logarithmically many rounds, I will have at most k elements remaining, and then the algorithm will terminate. And so what are the main steps for the proof of this uh, main lemma? So if it's going to ex exploit that at every iteration, we know that a random set has value at most t, otherwise the algorithm will have re uh, returned a random set. And so what this low value of a random set implies by exploiting subordinate is that uh, in average, a surviving element is going to have contribution to a random set that's at most t over k. So this is because a random set has k elements, and we know it has value at most t. So one, so an average element can have contribution at most t over k. Okay. And so now, why is this useful? Uh, we know that by definition, the algorithm is going to discard elements that have contribution to a random set at most c times t over k for some constant c, okay? And so if, in average, the elements have contribution at most t over k, then that means that there has to be at least a constant fraction of them that have contribution at most c times t over k if, if c is a constant greater than 1. And sorry, so that, uh, oops, yeah. sorry, just a quick question. I'm a bit confused. Why does that... Um not discard a lot of elements. So, you know, I would have expected that this t by k on the last line would be the actual um, value that you get on the previous line instead of just the upper bound. So why couldn't every element a satisfy the last constraint? Um, good, so, so, so here, so this slide is about showing that we have good adaptivity. So if every element had, was below this threshold, then we would just remove all of the elements and be done in one round and be happy. And so in the next slide, I will mention why we get a good approximation. So why we don't remove all of the elements. Okay. But right now, I just want to argue that we remove sufficient, sufficiently many elements at every round. Okay. Does that answer your question? Oh, it will be answered on the next slide, I think. So okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So, that, so that's true. Like we. There's this trade-off where we both want to remove a lot of elements to have low adaptivity, but we also don't want to remove too many elements because then we will have a bad solution. And so here I'm arguing that we remove sufficiently many elements to have logarithmic adaptivity, and now I'm going to argue uh, why we can also get a good approximation. Okay, and so the main lemma to show we get a good approximation is that at every round, if we look at the optimal solution O, 
So this, this is the set of size here that has the highest value. And we look at which are the optimal elements that were discarded at around. Then we're going to be able to bound the, va the, the value of these optimal discarded elements. Okay. And so this bound is going to be one plus this constant C times the threshold T. And so what this is saying is that if we pick a threshold T that is um, at most uh, roughly like one over log n, then and more after logarithmically many rounds, this lemma will guarantee that there is some optimal surviving elements that have still large value, meaning that after logarithmic many rounds, there will still be some optimal elements remaining that have high value. And these will be returned by the algorithm and we will get that value. So here, what I just want to say is that the value that we lose from the optimal elements at every round is bounded when we discard elements. Okay. And so what are the main steps? Uh, so the high level overview of this main lemma. So first by similarity, we can bound the value of the optimal discarded elements by the expected value of a random set plus the uh, sum of the contributions of these optimal discarded elements to a random set. Okay. And now we can bound the value by a random set by the threshold t. Again, this is by the algorithm, because if a random set has value at more than t, then the algorithm returns this set. And so then we want to bound uh, the contribution of the disk of the, the contribution of the discarded optimal elements. So we know that the algorithm is going to discard elements that have low contribution, so that have contribution at most c times t over k. But we know that the opti there's at most, we know that the, the, the optimal set is a set of size k. And so that what implies is that there's at most k optimal elements that are discarded at any round. And so if there's at most k elements that are discarded at every round, the sum of the contributions of these optimal discarded elements is at most c times t. Okay, and so now we've brought in each of these terms and we get this one plus c over t. And so as I mentioned before, for this to imply a good approximation with the surviving ele elements at the n, we have to pick t um, to be uh, roughly um, opt over log n. So opt is the value of the optimal solution. But now, if we if we pick the threshold t to be up to the log n, whenever a random set has value at least t, it is returned. So then we would get one over log n with the random set returned. So this is why this algorithm gets a one over log n approximation. Okay. And Eric, sorry, when you say log yeah. n, you actually mean log n, or you mean log k? So for the the previous slide, it was log k, I think, the number of iterations that you needed. And now... So this is actually going to be log n, okay. uh, because we're going to be removing a, a constant. So k is the number of elements we want to pick. And oh, yeah, so the, mm -hmm. and the, the approximation is log n, but the adaptivity, is that is that not log k? Uh, no, it's going to be log n, because... Okay. So we have a ground set of n elements, and k is the number of elements we want to pick. And we're going to be removing an element, a constant fraction of element from the ground set of elements. Oh, That's yeah. initially n. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Very good. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is for down sampling. Uh, so now let me describe more formally up sampling. So up sampling, instead of maintaining a set of surviving elements that haven't yet been discarded, it's going to maintain a set, a current solution where we add elements to it. And so upsampling is going to proceed in R rounds for some number R. And here the distribution is going to be as follow. It's going to be the uniform distribution over all subsets of elements that have not yet been added to the current solution of size K over R. So now we're not sampling sets of size K anymore, but sets of size K over R. 
And what we're going to do is just add a random subset of high value to the current solution at every round. And so what is this random subset is that we're going to sample multiple sets. And we're just going to look at this. We're going to look, pick the sample that has the highest contribution to the current solution. And so over all of the sample, we pick this uh, the sample that has the highest contribution to current solution, the solution and add it to the solution S. OK? And so at each of our rounds, we're going to add k over r elements to the solution, we're going to finish with k elements, and we're going to return the solution s. And again, so if this here, if we have r, which is k, so if r is k, we're going to have k rounds. And at every round, we're going to pick one element. So the one best element, this is going to be the greedy algorithm. And so in fact, if you want, and we're going to get a constant approximation. And if you want to get a constant approximation, with this algorithm, we need linear adaptivity. Okay. So this is app sampling. So now let me present uh, the main algorithm. So the main algorithm is adaptive sampling, and it's going to combine these two sampling primitives. So we're going to have both the set X of surviving elements that have not yet been discarded, and the set S, which is the current solution. And so now the distribution is going to be the uniform distribution of uh, surviving elements that have not been added to the current solution and sets of size k over r. Okay. And so now I mentioned that depending on the context, we're either going to upsample or downsample. So what is the context? We're going to look at uh, the marginal contribution of a random set from the distribution to the current solution. And so if a random set has high contribution to the current solution, we're going to want to upsample. Otherwise, we're going to downsample. And then we're going to do that until we have a current solution S of size K, and then return the current solution. OK, so why intuitively uh, this this condition for upsampling and downsampling makes sense is that if I'm in the iteration where I have a random set that has high value, then I'm going to want to add elements to my solution because I know I can find a random set of high value. On the other hand, if I'm in an iteration where a random set has low value, then it must be the case that there's lots of elements that have low marginal contribution to this set. Otherwise, they wouldn't have low value. And so then I'm going to be able to discard a large number of elements. OK. And so um, two other uh, detail, uh, not de two other minor points I want to mention about the algorithm is that what I've presented is like an, ide an idealized version of the algorithm. Um, because the, the threshold t is going to depend on opt, as I mentioned, which is the optimal value. And we don't know the optimal value. In, in, uh, and we, no, we don't know the optimal value. So one thing we can do for, for that, for, we can guess opt. So we can pick uh, log n increasing different guesses for opt. And then we can run in parallel the algorithm with each of the different guesses. That won't increase the adaptivity because all of these algorithms are run in parallel. And we know that at least one of the guesses will be arbitrarily close to opt. So at least one of the instances of the algorithm will work well. And then we can just return the best solution from all of these algorithms. And this will be guaranteed to have a good solution. So this is the first, uh, this is the first of the two uh, idealized assumptions for this algorithm. The second one is like with the expectations. Uh, we can't evaluate exactly these expectations. Uh, but one thing we can do is that we can just use sampling. So with enough sampling from the distribution, we can approximate, we can estimate these expectations arbitrarily well. Okay. So just by sampling and have sampled every iteration, we will be able to estimate 
out of out of the expectations that we need up to arbitrarily uh, to have obtained arbitrarily good estimates. Okay, good. Um, and so now let me imagine at a high level how the analysis for the main algorithm goes. So first we have the adaptivity. We want to show the organ adaptivity. So we have two types of iterations. There's either each iteration is either a down sampling iteration or an up sampling iteration. In terms of the down sampling iterations, we can argue similarly as for down sampling that we're going to remove a constant fraction of the surviving elements at every round. So there's going to be at most a con a logarithmically many down sampling iterations until we have at most k elements that are surviving. Then for up sampling iterations, we're adding k over r elements to the solution at every round. And what we're going to do is that we're going to be we need to pick r to be logarithmic in n. So we're going to be adding k over log n elements at every round. And so after log logarithmically many iterations of upsampling, we will have a solution of size k. So since there are at most logarithmically many iterations of downsampling and at most logarithmically many iterations of upsampling, together we have at most logarithmically many iterations for uh, adaptive sampling. Okay. So that's for the adaptivity. Next, what we have for the approximation. And now, the main idea for the approximation is to use this similar approach as for downsampling, where we're going to bound the value of the optimal elements that are discarded at every iteration. But now what we're going to be able is we're going to be able to obtain a much better bound on the value of optimal elements that are discarded. And what's the main reason why we get a much better bound? The main reason is because now we're going to be sampling uh, sets of size k over r, so k over log n. And this is going to be much smaller than the sets of size k that we were sampling for down sampling. And so very intuitively, if we're sampling much smaller sets, the overlap between the value of a random set and the optimal elements is going to be much smaller. And so we're going to maintain much more of the value of the optimal elements. And so really, it's really this idea of like combining upsampling and downsampling that allows to obtain this constant factor approximation. Okay. So that was the end of the overview of the analysis of the algorithm. So now just to recap, uh, the main result that is obtained by this algorithm is that we obtain that for the problem of maximizing a monotone semi-modular function under quantity constraints, um, a, one, uh, a log n adaptive algorithm that obtains with high probability an approximation ap arbitrarily close to one third. Okay. So before I move on to the lower bound, are there any questions about the algorithm, uh, the analysis, or the result it obtains? So do, do you um, care about making this better for small values of k? So if, if k is small, you can get, um, I mean, if k is really small, then you can just do it in one uh, or a very small number of rounds, right? Yes, exactly. So if k is, if k is, uh, is tiny, you can just brute force over all of the sets. But there's still like a small range where like you can brute force over all sets and it might be a bit smaller than log n. And uh, that's an open question. Yeah, we, it's, it's not clear what to do in that case. So I guess we're, get... we're going to see the hardness result, but it doesn't rule out that same theorem with log k instead of log n. Um, yeah, no, so the hardness result is going to be meaningful for the case where k is uh, greater than log n. k is greater than log n or k is greater than... Okay, well, yeah. let's just see it. Sorry, let's just see it. Wait, wait, wait. So, yeah, so the, so the hardness result, um, so what the hardness result show is that uh, if we want to get a constant factor approximation, we can do that in, in much smaller than, in, in smaller than log n rounds, basically. Uh, so for the problem of maximizing a monotone semi-modular function under community constraints, there's no log n over log log n adaptive algorithm that obtains even with low probability one over log n approximation. Okay. 
So here, if I come back to the question about, if I understand correctly, the question asks, well, what happens for the case where k is small? So maybe uh, k is uh, on the order of log n or a bit smaller. And uh, then maybe it's possible to get a better than 30. And so, yeah, so I think, again, like if k is very small, we can just do brute force. So I think the interesting case is really when k is much smaller, than, much, much bigger than log n. But there's still this small window that is open for the values of k. Okay. So if we look just at the dependence on n, we can get better than this log n over log log n adaptivity. And so how we show this hardness result is that we're going to construct some hard functions. And so these hard functions are going to be defined in terms of a partition of the ground set into layers. So I'm going to denote these layers L0 through LR and L star. And um, the, the, the main lemma we're going to show for that is that we're going to argue that it's impossible for any algorithm to learn which elements are in layer Li uh, at around I or before. So in particular, that would imply that after R rounds of adaptivity, the algorithm won't know which are the elements in LR and L star. So it won't be able to distinguish these two layer LR and L star. And that will be problematic because the optimal solution will be L star. So it won't be able to find a good solution. And so to argue that the algorithm cannot learn which elements are in Li as run I or before, we're going to use a round elimination technique that's similar as in communication complexity. Okay. So this is really like, just in the interest of time, this was just like a super high level overview of the hardness result. And there's many more details and I encourage you to look at the paper if you want to look more about uh, the hardness results. Okay. Are there any questions about the hardness results? Okay, so if there's no question, I can move on to uh, the experiments. And again, here, uh, again, I think that the, the main benefit of this new algorithm is that it gives an algorithm with power runtime, which is exponentially faster than any previous constant factor approximation for similar optimization. And here, I really just want to convince you that this is not just a theoretical algorithm that they can also be used in practice and obtain good performance. And so, we have done uh, several experiments in different papers, but we also have started this collaboration with a bio lab at Harvard. And uh, I want to show you results, uh, preliminary results from this collaboration. And so here, uh, what's the setting is that, uh, so in this lab, they have like these really large collections of like gene sequences. And so what they would like to do is cluster these gene sequences for DNA analysis. And so, um, so, to cl so one approach to clustering is this approach of exemplar clustering, which formulates the clustering problem as a submodular objective. And so this is what we're going to look at. So first here, I'm showing you the performance of greedy. And so really what I'm here, what I'm measuring is that I'm looking at a run of greedy where they, they want to pick uh, 50 elements. And at every iteration of greedy, I'm plotting its current objective value, the, it, the value of the current solution at that iteration. So this is, at the end, it obtains close to 80 in the objective value. And here I'm just plotting the, how the value of the current solution increases at every round of the, the algorithm. And so now if I show you uh, the same plot, but for adaptive sampling, um, what you observe is that adaptive sampling, it gets uh, ne near identical performance to greedy algorithm, but it's really able to get uh, this in a much, much, much smaller number of rounds. Okay. So that was the, this is, just one experiment uh, I wanted to show you. We have some others in some papers and I encourage you to take a look at it if you want to look at more experiments for that. Okay. 
And so now um, I would like to mention some uh, recent results. So I think since uh, this uh, first result has been several other uh, new results for adaptivity and some model optimization. So I think the first and most natural question is that the previous algorithm I mentioned, it gets a one third approximation. And we know that the best approximation obtainable for some model optimization is one micron over E. And so it's very natural to ask, well, is it actually possible to get this optimal one micron over E approximation in logarithmically many rounds? So get the best of both worlds in terms of like the approximation and the adaptivity. And the answer to that is yes. So there was uh, two um, independent papers this year at SODA that um, showed that. So for the problem of maximizing a monotone submodular function under community constraints, there is a log n adaptive algorithm that obtained with high probability an approximation arbitrarily close to a minus one over e. So what this implies is that we can actually get this exponential speed up in parallel running time with only an arbitrarily small sacrifice in the approximation that's achievable in preneural time. Okay, so we really get the best of both worlds. Like the adaptivity that goes from linear to logarithmic while still maintaining the optimal one of every approximation. And so what are some of the main ideas that goes in this algorithm? So it's going to be, it's also going to use this idea of like adaptive sampling, but it's going to have some important differences. So two of those are like, one is that the elements that we're going to discard, they're not going to be discarded permanently. Uh, sometimes we're going to bring uh, back uh, the discarded elements uh, back to life. And, uh, and then the second difference is that we're going to have um, an adaptive thresholding technique. We're now going to have this fixed threshold T. We're going to have thresholds that are going to vary and be adaptive for each round. Okay. So that's uh, for the optimal approximation with log and adaptivity. Now, as I previously mentioned, um, the arguably the most general um, uh, setting for which we know that um, some constant approximation for some other optimization is uh, for maturity constraints instead of in, instead of quality constraints. And so very recently, uh, there's been uh, three independent papers that got uh, this one minus one over E approximation for not currently constraints, but for metric constraints. And this is, there's like another log n factor in the activity. So this is like a log square n, uh, these are like log square n adaptive algorithm that obtained with high probability of one minus one over E minus epsilon approximation. Okay. And so um, our algorithm for this, it's going to depart from this idea of like adaptive sampling where at every round we're going to sample a large number of random sets. And instead of sampling random set, it's going to sample a single random sequence. And doing this sequencing and considering elements in a certain order is going to be crucial for the new algorithm and for mature rate constraints. Intuitively, it's very hard to generate random feasible sets when we have um, a complex metric constraint, which is not uniform anymore. And so with this random sequence, we're now going to be able to navigate randomly to the metroid. Okay, so that's for uh, the case of metric constraints. Um, there's a lot of other results. So the first one is better approximation guarantees for some other function that have this property of bounded curvature. Another one, and they were, that was mentioned in some questions previously about like how many queries do we allow in every round? I mentioned that we allow pretty many queries in every round in general. For our algorithm that I mentioned previously, if you do the concentration bounds for how many samples you need to get good estimates, you need n times k squared queries for the algorithm. So this query complexity has been improved to a quasi-linear and exactly linear, which is optimal. What it is saying is that you can actually get the best uh, approximation, the best adaptivity, and the best query complexity all together. Um, packing constraints have also been studied uh, in, the, in the adaptive complexity model. 
Um, there's also been multiple approximations that have been obtained for the case of non-monotone instead of monotone, uh, some modular maxi for some modular function under quality constraints. So now if you also want to consider the unconstrained case, as it was uh, asked at the beginning of the talk, so here we can consider for in the case of unconstrained, what's interesting is like non-monotone functions. So for unconstrained non-monotone summary maximization, it was a recent paper that got um, a one half minus epsilon approximation with constant adaptivity. So here the lower bound uh, does not hold because it was for current constraint. And also for unconstrained non-monotone summary maximization, we know that the best adaptivity is one half. So here what's interesting is that they get an approximation, um, an optimal approximation and only a constant adaptivity. And then finally, there's also been um, this recently this lower bound that shows this interesting trade-off between number of queries and adaptivity for some modular minimization. And in particular, what it shows is that a lower bound of uh, roughly n square over r to the fifth queries for any r adaptive algorithm for some modular minimization. So what this is saying is that if we want an algorithm for some modular minimization that, you, that, is, that has sub-quadratic time, sub-quadratic sub running time, then we need at least polynomial adaptivity. Okay. So these were all of the very recent results uh, on uh, adaptivity and some model optimization. So just to conclude, uh, our main result, what we show is that for the problem of maximizing a monotone sum modular function under a quantity constraint, uh, we show that uh, up to lower the term log any rounds of queries or samples are necessary and sufficient to obtain a constant approximation. So the main implication is that that means that when we allow for parallelization, so when functional evaluations can be executed in parallel, we get an algorithm that achieves a constant factor approximation exponentially faster than any previous constant factor approximation for some modular maximization. And also this relies on a very new uh, algorithmic technique that we call adaptive sampling. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thanks. Um, so do we have, uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can speak up or type it up. Okay, maybe just while you think about it, I have one question, which is, um, uh, maybe you said this, but in terms of just brute sample complexity, do you, yeah. um, so greedy, I can compute, uh, greedy probably makes like N queries per iteration, and then there's a number of iterations. So in your case, you have to estimate all these um, expectations. So it seems like it wouldn't be too high in the end, but is it, does it, um, how does it scale? Do you know? Yeah, so if you want to compare the um, query complexity of our algorithm compared to greedy, so exactly as you mentioned, um, the greedy algorithm, it needs to compute all of the module contribution of the elements at every round. So n uh, queries per round in this k rounds. So there's n times k total query complexity. For our algorithm, for the concentration bounds for the expectation, uh, we need to get n times k square queries. So we, we, we lose a factor k compared to greedy for our, um, uh, a naive analysis of standard concentration bound of our algorithm. Um, but there's two things is that first in the experiments, we observe that uh, we really didn't need that many queries. Only a very small number of queries per element was sufficient to get it for the algorithm to perform well. And actually there's also been these recent results that uh, do like some um, more sophisticated um, concentration analysis and some new algorithm that show that you can actually get this linear number of queries, which is actually even better than the greedy algorithm. Thanks. Other questions? I mean, if not, I'll take us offline. We can still hang out a little bit offline. So uh, thanks to everyone for joining in. I remind you that uh, two weeks from now, we'll have uh, Julia Chuzoi for the last talk of the fall. And uh, today, this was uh, Eric Balkansky. So um, thanks, Eric. And I'll, I'll take it uh, offline. Thank you.